Celikovic. Celikovic, ok. Sì. Ok, we're gonna let it uh, a couple of seconds to see if somebody is tuning in. Um, usually I send also like uh, some kind of like, we are gonna be live at this time, mm. uh, but uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's hard to make it happen, so today I didn't, I didn't do it, let's see what happens. Yeah. And anyway, all the information is going to be posted in the actual post mm. on the page. So, today well, I'm accompanied by Igor Celikovic, who does many things, but mainly I'm interested in his work as one of the great organizers of TEDx Brussels. Mm. Uh, I'm sure that most of people following this page are familiar with the TEDx concept, but I want to know more about what, uh, what is behind the scene. And apart from that, uh, I was kind of inspired by an article you wrote uh, some time ago. Mm. Long, time was, ago. long time ago. Long time ago, right? <laughs> which was called uh, you, Why You Should Get Lost in Your Twenties. Yeah. Okay, Igor, first of all, I mean, how do you even start, how do you even come up with the idea of building a telex event? Um, in general, from scratch? Yes, or? yes, I mean, you know, like you wake up in the morning one day and you say, okay, hey, I want to do a TEDx, what's the story? How, 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 does, how does that even start? Well, from, from, for many people it's, it's, it comes from a different, from, from totally different uh, perspectives, from different, in, it starts in different ways, but for me it started just because I wanted to volunteer, I wanted to do something and I was in Brussels, I was doing my internship in the European Commission and I was getting a bit like, okay, is this it? Is this really what I can do for the rest of my life? Just be in an institution and do regular work and there's nothing else to it? So I realized I wanted to do a bit more with my time and I applied to volunteer the first TEDx Brussels okay. event in 2009. Um, but that's how my story started with TEDx Brussels, but when you have to start an event from scratch and do everything that needs to be done to have the end event where you have speakers on stage, where speakers are prepared, they have the right slides, they have the right things, and if people come out of the event, they say, whoa, like I've seen things that I've never seen before, I've heard ideas that I've never heard before. I think that's basically the end goal that where we want to achieve, where we want to go. And that's, where, and that's how, when we start, we start thinking about how do we create that experience. I think that's what drives us as organizers. Okay, so basically you had already an interest in the TEDx model, in, yeah. in their activities. You wanted to volunteer, you wanted to do something more yeah. apart from your, your regular job. So you had already a passion, I guess, for uh, the TEDx themes and from, from the old concept, about, about the old concept. And, okay, and then you took it out further because yeah. you, you became really involved. And this year, I, I, well, I had the pleasure of coming to TEDx Brussels. Yeah. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And my question is, first of all, how do you come up with a theme? So mm. how do you decide, okay, this year we're going to do this, this and that? Yeah. I mean, it's ringing, it's okay. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's every, Facebook Live. Everything, so. is, everything <laughs> is ringing. Um. First of all, how do you come up with a theme? And secondly, yeah. then, how do you start thinking of potential speakers? Because, you know, content is key. So you mm. gotta find people that fit in a certain theme, fly them over from all over the world. As mm. I mean, I've seen uh, professors in robotics from American universities. Yeah. I've seen English teachers. I've seen uh, Korean Belgian chefs. I mean, the uh, the the lineup was absolutely fantastic. Mm. So how do you come up with a theme, and then how do you then work it into finding speakers that can be collected under this umbrella? Yeah, I mean, the, the, theme, the theme is usually developed by, by the curator. Uh, so we have curator Rudy Arno, and I'm co-curating with him. So the two of us, we meet, we go for a beer, and then we discuss, like, what can be a theme that is fitting enough to kind of take the TEDx spirit to the TEDx audience. Because what is so particular about TEDx in respect to other conferences is that TEDx is more open to... Uh, whole variety of ideas, unlike some other conferences that, that conferences that focus on, I don't know, food safety or road transport or digital, even digital, you know, it can yes. be quite a heavy conference if all you all you hear for the whole day is just social media or, or Facebook Live or these kind of things. So what at TEDx we try to do is we try to have a theme that is open towards potentially a lot of ideas. And for example, the theme of TEDx Brussels this year was... Um, was no limits and yes. when you have a theme no limits there are no limits on what you can do with a theme so it's also like playing with the concept in so many ways from 
the selection of speakers you do, you, there is no limits in who can you invite. Exactly. Speakers have to fit in the, in the theme in some way with their idea. So they try to find an idea that is fitting with it. And also it drives our selection of the speakers and who are we looking for. Sometimes we look for the speaker, sometimes we look for the idea, and then the speaker just shows himself to fit that idea that we want to portray okay. on, the, on, the, on the event. Yeah, so th this year's theme was No Limits. And I've seen topics, talks from, you know, uh, the power of uh, medicinal drugs to where are we going to take robots? Are robots going to replace humans? So um, I really enjoyed the way you put it all together under this concept. And also, I thought it was very motivational. The fact that your brain, your ambitions, your goals should have no limits. So, yeah. And you know, seeing how many people came, I thought it was absolutely successful. And I think you, sh you chose a, a terrific location. Mm. And something that really fascinated me is, you know, uh, in, in, in Brussels and the Europe, but we go to conferences all the time. Mm. But what I noticed there was the motivation of the volunteers. Mm. Because, you know, you enter and you see all these perfectly prepared people ready to help you out with, uh, mm. since, you know, where can I hang my coat, or where can I find a program, or where can I get food, where can I get water. And everybody, I, I could feel, was very young, but incredibly mm. motivated. Yeah. So I think there was uh, definitely an added value. What, what's coming up in the future? Do you already have plans for the future, or after this event, now things? You, I think uh, the next TEDx Brussels, I think it's already set for the 5th of March next year. Okay. It's still going to happen in Bazaar. Uh, there is no theme yet, no speakers, speakers yet. It's kind of a quiet period now. Of course. Uh, before the storm, com storm the comes storm, again. Yes. Um, but it, I just wanted to catch up on the on the yes. on the, vol on, on the volunteer right. part because I'm, I'm very passionate about about my volunteers and I still consider them mine, even though I wasn't coordinating the volunteer team this year. Because um, that's how I started with TEDx. I mean, the 2009 I was a volunteer, and from 2010 to 2014 I was coordinating the group of 50 volunteers every single year. So. I, I think, as you rightly pointed out, that's so much part of the experience. Uh, maybe I mean, the talks, of course, are paramount. Like that's that's what you come to that explore. But yes. ever since you cross that door and it's you come to that experience, experience. Yes. I mean, we are not only designing an event uh, and only designing talks. We are designing an experience of a, of a half a day or a day event. Um, and we want people to go back home and they say, wow, like it was a friendly atmosphere where we could share ideas. It's all, it's all about ideas. I mean, ideas are in the focus on, on TEDx. But the volunteers, I think, are, are so, so important to, to create this atmosphere. But this is what I like um, because it's the first time that I hear TEDx experience. Yeah. Right? That's what you said. Yeah. And in fact, that's how it felt because if it was just about creating content, you would make the videos, share them on YouTube, on your Facebook, on your social media. Yeah. But, you know, that wouldn't be an experience, that would be just content. And content is key, I think it's true, but then the success of the event depends on so many factors. The way you welcome the people, the way you give people opportunity to, net, to do networking, because I remember, contrary to other similar conferences, the breaks are longer. Yeah. So people that go there and have a common interest in these kind of things, they also get the time to do networking, which is something that many events, also in a career-oriented place like Brussels or a job-oriented place like Brussels or a business-oriented place like Brussels, yeah. is highly underestimated. Most of the times they go to conferences like, yes, the conference is all day and uh, you will have like a 15 minutes break for coffee, 30 minutes for lunch. But that, firstly, that, that is unsustainable because you, there is just a certain amount of information you can consume in a day, or actually by the hour, and also you need both the time to stretch, but also to, you know, take advantage of the opportunity to do networking with other people that are at the end. And I think TEDx was, well, it was an email for the whole day, right? No, it was just one afternoon, so it was, uh, afternoon. It was designed in three, in three sessions, but we had TEDx events in Brussels before who, were, who took the whole day. But what we decided from 2016 was to go for a half a day event, because I also think that there is as much as you can take in uh, throughout the day. So for me, it would be difficult to sit through, a, through an enti entire day of, uh, of talks. It's almost, almost impossible physically to sustain that. Even if you go to the big TED conference that TED organizes in New York, yes, yes, when you yes. go to those conferences, also people don't usually go and listen to every single session. They watch them on videos later on, but they use the time to meet the people that exactly. come to the conference. It's, it's really about the, the people, about the audience as well. 
as much as, as, as it is about the speakers and their ideas. I think if you come to TEDx event, whether it be Brussels or Berlin or Paris or somewhere else, you go there not only to listen to the ideas of the speakers, you go there to really connect to the people in the audience because the audience is so diverse and I think you've seen that as well. Definitely. There is no one single predominant culture there. There is no, they're not only consultants, uh, your bubble people, uh, they're also like uh, doctors, uh, designers, it's everybody, artists, everybody's going there. Yeah. So This is exactly the aspect I enjoyed the most about the event. But talking about volunteers, so yeah. young and enthusiastic people yeah. that decide to dedicate their time to a cause, you wrote this article, why you should get lost in your 20s. Yeah. That, uh, I mean, in this area, I know many people who read it, yeah. and I think it is uh, quite inspirational. So, what, what did you say in this article, in this piece? Exactly? I mean, the, main, the main idea that I, that I Everything remember... Everything is going to be posted, we're going to, there's yeah, going to be a link. So I mean, what, what do you say The in main this idea that I remember is that kind of you don't want to uh, bet the ideas of yourself in the future. You don't want to bet your 20s, like all like the 10 years of your life, into what you're going to be in the future. Because I think, so what I, what I saw with myself and also with other people when you're in, your, in university, People are trying to steer you in a way like, think about what do you want to do when you grow up? Like, what do you want to be like, you know, down the line when you're 40? And for me, it always kind of a bit, uh, felt a bit off. It felt a bit like, really, am I going to work on something that I don't really fully enjoy just so that I have it on my CV? Just so that my curriculum vitae looks a bit fancier? And in Brussels, I mean, people really know what it means. I mean, you need to have two internships, one in the ETU institution, and possibly, you know, a couple of consultants in the European Parliament or something, uh, and that also be familiar, volunteer yeah. everywhere. <laughs> but I mean, that kind of rush, I think, leads to nowhere. So for, for me, what really worked in my life, and that's why I wrote the article, is that I just let, let everything go, and I wasn't kind of uh, rushing towards a specific thing. I just had no idea where I was going. So I think getting lost meant in the sense, just do whatever you like doing right now, to the best of your capabilities. Like, if you like designing something, just go and design, you know, like stay at home, like don't have a work for, for a month or two, just design, but like every day for eight hours, 10 hours a day, you know, and that's what I was doing. When I didn't have any work, I was just doing things that I liked and I developed some skill set. That is totally weird. I mean, I know how to design, I know how to make amateur movies now, I know how to organize events, uh, or how to do some social media. Basically, and, like, you invested in yourself. You invest in, in yourself. Where you yeah. couldn't couldn't work. And this approach is very interesting, I think. It's very telling about the um, divide between our generation and our parents' generation. Yeah. Because um, I read an interesting article on psychology some time ago that uh, basically identifies how current generations value experiences, and we go back to the TEDx experience, mm. experiences more than possessions, yeah. while our parents' generations were more concerned with stability, yeah. buy a house, build a mortgage, get married by a certain age, uh, make a solid investment that will give you just stability. Yeah. But this, here's experience, yeah. because basically you end up, not for everybody, but uh, it has been a considerable chapter of our parents' generation society, mm. you mostly will do a job for the rest of your life, mm. while now there has been a switch of values. Mm. Of course, in those economies that allow you that, because then there are other factors at play in the, in, in the ability of an individual to pursue a career or a pursue a, a certain lifestyle. But now there is this uh, interest in experience. So people might be interested more in uh, traveling or uh, investing in their education, in their formation as much as they can, mm. rather than having a mortgage for 30 years. Yeah. What do you think about that? No, I actually totally happening? agree. I mean, but no, but that's, that's the whole Airbnb <laughs> culture. It's the whole, uh, I'm going to rent a car instead of owning a car. Although I do own a car now, but I mean, I, I don't see a lot of utility having it during the week. I mean, I like it for the weekends, but you can also opt for just, you know, having a rental when you need something. I mean, that's, the, that's also like where the economy is going. Of course, not everywhere, but in many places. But like, I mean, experience is definitely, and I think, people value experiences so much because they can remember them and they, they feel them uh, that the experience is much more 
uh, valuable investment of, of the money instead of paying for a course and having a certificate. Like I never went for a language course in my life uh, to have a certificate, you know, like I, I still don't have an English, yeah, I don't have an English certificate. I speak Italian, we speak it in Italian, I don't have an Italian certificate that I have uh, a, a degree yeah, course, course, or, yeah. or French or whatever. So it's, I think mentality is changing and I think one of, one of, one of the important uh, thing is, um, is the crisis. Like we are in crisis so since, since 2008. Yeah, okay. Yes, tell, and I think crisis is the most, the best thing that we can <laughs> that we can live through. And I think everybody who has been living through 2008 till now, that is, in this period, has been living through. Like I finished university, and what am I supposed to do? I think these people are lucky. And I think that's the other way of looking at, at the thing. Because if it were in crisis, you would just end up doing the first thing from college, having a job, and then you would never change your job. I mean, maybe you would change them a couple of times, but you wouldn't have the chance to reinvent yourself. And, and in this regard, in fact, you know, talking about uh, uh, different values for different generations, the point is that for people, well, I'm 31, so I graduated exactly in the middle of the crisis. Yeah. It was 2009. Yeah. And the point is that it's not that we don't value stability, perhaps. The point is that we have never had it. Yeah, of course. So we don't know what it means to have a job for life. You're forced to reinvent yourself. Exactly. So by not knowing that value, we don't consider it anymore. Yeah. So we see that um, people now in their 20s or 30s even might change job 10 or 20 times. And they will. <laughs> but there was a statistic that, that said that on average, people are going to change, who enter the workforce now, seven jobs during their career, on average, out of which five jobs have never been have never have not been invented yet. Exactly. So exactly. how do you position yourself in that kind of world? Do you go and you know exactly what you want to be, or do you go the other way? You just get lost and you just do whatever you like, what makes you happy in that time. Of course, I'm not saying that you should change your job every two two months. Like there is some sort of reasoning yes, in, of in this. But I think if you develop a skill set that is future proof, I think that's that's where you want to go. You don't want to be uh, having a degree and like, okay, this is it. Like I'm now a lawyer for the rest of my life. You know what? Back to TEDx. Uh, there was exactly one speaker that I think uh, embodied this concept. It was now I don't remember the name. It was this English guy. Okay. That kind of either traveled the world. Dave with no Corn. Money. Dave Corn Yeah. Okay, can you tell me more about this experience? Because yeah. I mean, that, this is exactly what you're saying. So it's somebody yeah. that was a bit lost in life, I think it came Quite a out, few people like that. Like quite a few people like that. And it's incredible how it goes from extreme <laughs> to a different extreme, it's exactly. incredible. But a positive extreme, I mean. And his story, which was very personal, I think, I, I, I don't remember, maybe he was coming out from a breakup, he had no money, Yeah. Uh, he was completely, he was... Like, had a job that made yeah. him lazy and exactly. playing so PlayStation was, every exactly. single day. So he and, reset, and he just at a like, certain yeah. moment, he kind of found ways to travel the world Without my like with eight pounds a, month, a day, something like that. Yeah. So, can you tell me more about that? But for him, it talk? wasn't even about the money. For him, it was about the challenge. So he tried to challenge himself to do different sort of uh, things wherever he traveled. I think it's called Expedition One Thousand, where he oh, does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he does one thousand miles on a non-motorized ah, vehicle. Yeah, exactly. So on a canoe. Yeah. Or and a I think he wants to do what twenty something of these trips until his. Some, some age until he can. <laughs> but he already did like more than 10 of, the, of these things. I mean, he skateboarded the whole Australia. <laughs> he scooted Japan. So no motor, just on a scoot. Uh, and he's doing now new experiments on what he can do. He was swimming in the Amazon and doing all sorts of things. And like that kind of started, of course, without making any money. And at the beginning, maybe he didn't need much. And then all, all of a sudden, after you've done it for a few years, people start looking for you and they want to support you. So kind of it becomes your job, it becomes your daily life. That's fantastic. And it yeah. also introduces the concept of uh, uh, being an entrepreneur of yourself. Because yeah. that's, that's what he did. Yeah. So like he self-funded his own life. Yeah. yeah. Without selling anything apart from motivation and inspiration. You know, exactly. It, it wasn't a physical product what he, what he managed to sell and give to the world. Igor, thank you so much. It was thank a great you. talk. Yeah. So tune in next week for another talk. I'm going to put all the links related to what we just discussed, uh, TEDx, uh, the, talk, the, the speakers, uh, your article. And if you have any questions, feel free to send them on my Facebook page. See you next week.